Hello, my name is Dr. Ann Wanaselia, and I am one of two of University of Pittsburgh's Obstetric Anesthesia and Women's Health Fellows. Welcome to our inaugural podcast for the UPMC Division of Obstetric and Women's Anesthesia. Today, we are excited to welcome Dr. Faisé Peralta to talk with us about updates in post dural puncture headache and epidural blood patch. Dr. Peralta is an associate professor at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine's Department of Anesthesiology, where she also serves as the Obstetric Anesthesiology Fellowship Program Director. She is a graduate of the Ohio State University Medical Center and Northwestern University Magog Medical Center. She has published in our specialty's major journals and is a recognized expert in obstetric anesthesiology. Welcome, Dr. Peralta. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for this invitation. You recently published this article in this month's issue of Anesthesiology that found that prophylactic intrathecal morphine given shortly after delivery through a catheter that was placed during accidental dural puncture did not decrease the incidence or severity of post dural puncture headache. You also had an unexpected finding of high rates of post dural puncture headache after placement of an intrathecal catheter at the level of the unintended dural puncture. Have these findings influenced the way you practice? Do you routinely give prophylactic intrathecal morphine after unintended dural puncture? So based on our findings, the use of prophylactic intrathecal morphine via an intrathecal catheter placed after an unintentional dural puncture does not appear to be a clinically effective strategy for reducing the incidence or severity of post dural puncture headache. Therefore, we have not changed our practice. What do you think about your unexpected finding of higher rates of headaches after intrathecal catheter? Has your study influenced how your practice regarding leaving intrathecal catheters at the level of the inadvertent dural puncture? Although an interesting finding, all of the study subjects in this study had an intrathecal catheter in place. Therefore, there were no comparisons um, to be made. Additionally, the factors that led to that initial unintentional dural puncture are likely to still be present and could lead to another unintentional dural puncture. Therefore, we still attempt to insert an intrathecal catheter after a recognized unintentional dural puncture. Did intrathecal catheters stay in place for 24 hours before removing them to reduce the risk of post dural puncture headache? This is a great question and has been uh, quite controversial in the past. Recent meta analysis and trial sequential analysis actually found no evidence supporting the benefit of uh, intrathecal catheters being placed for, for a long period for the prevention of post puncture headache. Should all wet taps get an intrathecal catheter or should an attempt at placing an epidural catheter at a different space be encouraged? I think this will depend on several factors, including the comfort level of the provider with the management of an intrathecal catheter. In my clinical practice, we opt to insert an intrathecal catheter after an unintentional dural puncture occurs. Now, if the patient complains of paresthesia when threatening this catheter, we immediately remove it and proceed with placement of an epidural catheter at another level. Your study was an excellent follow-up to the classic question, does prophylactic morphine in the epidural space decrease the risk of dural puncture headache? Do you routinely use epidural morphine as a preventative strategy in patients with a recited epidural catheter? What about autologous blood in an epidural catheter or a so-called prophylactic epidural blood patch? Great questions. Um, so, no. For safety reasons, we do not endorse the administration of epidural morphine for the prevention of post dural puncture headache after an intentional dural puncture. We believe that translocation of higher doses of morphine to the intrathecal space in the wrong patient could compromise their respiratory function. The second part, from a previous study conducted by Dr. Barbara Scavone at our institution, the administration of prophylactic epidural blood patch does not decrease the incidence, onset time, severity of post puncture headache, or the need for therapeutic epidural blood patch. However, those in the prophylactic 
epidural blood patch group did have a short duration of PDPH symptoms. Therefore, clinicians may consider prophylactic epidural blood patch for very high risk patients after weighing risks and benefits. Thank you so much for answering some questions about your study. I'd like to also tap into your expertise about inadvertent dural puncture and your thoughts on some management strategies. I have heard that epidural blood patch should be avoided within the first 24 hours after an unintended dural puncture because it can fail. Is this true? Do you recommend waiting 24 hours before doing an epidural blood patch? So this is a very relevant clinical question. From Dr. Pig's study, we know that the risk of failure is greater when an epidural blood patch is performed within 48 hours of a dural puncture. However, like everything else in medicine, we have to weigh risks versus benefit. If someone is having a severe PDPH, which can be defined as a pain score greater or equal to seven, or just the presence of neurologic symptoms, epidural blood patch should not be delayed. The right thing to do is to sit down with a patient and explain our, thought, our thoughts and allow them to be involved in the decision-making process. Um, in my clinical practice, we routinely offer epidural blood patches um, after 24 hours, um, if the patients meet criteria for it. What do you think um, sphenopalatine ganglion blocks, what role do they play in management of the inadvertent dural puncture? Do you use this intervention in your practice? So the sphenopalatine ganglion blocks have become the new kid on the block, um, treatment for the management of post puncture headache. I believe that at this time, um, the use of SPGs um, is limited or should be limited. They should be offered as a temporizing measure for patients with severe posture puncture headache that are not eligible to receive an epidural blood patch. I think more evidence is necessary to really recommend these blocks as a part of the treatment of posture puncture headache. What role does conservative and pharmacologic strategies play in your management of post puncture headache? Do you always offer these interventions to patients prior to offering an epidural blood patch? The answer is yes, because of the low risk of these interventions. We offer conservative management in the form of oral acetaminophen and caffeine to patients that have a mild to moderate headache in the absence of neurologic symptoms. These are more temporizing measures while waiting for the natural course of this diagnosis to evolve, such as resolution within a week after onset of symptoms in most patients. Sometimes we have patients being evaluated for more than one blood patch. When do you think head imaging, such as MRI or CT, is warranted? Should all patients returning for a possible second or third blood patch uh, receive brain imaging? So we know from recent prospective studies that complete and permanent relief of headache after one epidural blood patch occurs in up to one third of women with post puncture headache following a dural puncture with an epidural needle. But up to 50 to 80% of them will only have partial relief. We also know that up to 20% of women receive little or no relief from an epidural blood patch, even if repeated. So my recommendation is the following. In cases of partial or no relief, a second epidural blood patch may be performed after ruling out other causes of headache. If a third epidural blood patch is being considered, it might be prudent to wait for radiologic imaging studies to rule out other potential causes of this headache. Performing a third epidural blood patch under fluoroscopy, for example, in the pain clinic, uh, should also be taken into consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you for being our guest on our inaugural UPMC Division of Obstetric and Women's Anesthesia podcast. This information is informative and we thank you so much for your time. Thank you. My pleasure.